I want to go over what Elon said in the earnings call today about lithium iron phosphate. It's nothing earth shattering, but it gives us a good indication of where Tesla is headed. And it kind of confirms some of the views that I've had about the way that Tesla is going to diver diversify its battery supply. Because my theory is, uh, one of the main questions I get asked, people wonder, all right, who are Tesla's competitors? And how is Tesla performing against those competitors? Well, all of Tesla's other competitors are other battery producers. You can take, Tesla can take all those batteries and turn them into value added products. All the other battery manufacturers, they're just making batteries and nothing else. So I don't see them as competition. I see them as it's kind of uh, like weaving straw into gold. Tesla can take batteries from any manufacturer, put them in their vehicles and make money out of them. So these aren't competitors. These are sources of revenue. <laughs> so just going back to what Elon said at uh, the, in the earnings call today. The first thing was Jerome Guillen, I think that's how you say his name, Guillen. He kicked things off by saying, we have a lot of very unique technology we've always uh, been dream dreaming about and we'll be putting into the semi. Now, I don't know what he's specifically talking about there. I'm hoping they're talking about like single crystal coated cathodes uh, with a high voltage. Originally, I think it was a year or two ago, Elon said that Tesla's current technology was good enough to hit the figures that Tesla advised of at the launch. If they're able to do a single crystal coated cathode uh, with higher voltage and therefore higher energy density, that means they can either exceed those figures or that's just cream and they can just make more profit off of it. But I, I don't think the Roadrunner battery is required for the Tesla Semi, and we'll come back to this in a moment. I'm just going to go through the other comments. Elon followed up by saying that there are two classes of chemistry, iron phosphate and nickel, which is really interesting because it's only the past few weeks where I've really started thinking about batteries in terms of two broad classes, that is uh, nickel and iron phosphate. People often ask what's the difference between a nickel cobalt aluminum and nickel manganese cobalt? Well, when you're getting up past 80 or 90 percent nickel, there's really not much of a difference between those two chemistries. So your choices really come down to a high nickel cathode, which can be either nickel manganese cobalt or nickel cobalt aluminum or lithium iron phosphate. So Elon goes on to explain that nickel is higher energy density and longer range, and the semi needs nickel because every unit of weight that you add to the Tesla Semi decreases the range. Essentially, he's saying that they can't use the lithium iron phosphate battery in the Semi, which all of us had assumed. And he goes on to say, what we're seeing is that the total vehicle efficiency is so high that they can get close to 300 miles of range. So he's basically shifted gears here, and now he's talking about the passenger cars. And he's saying that they can get close to 300 miles of range with a lithium iron phosphate. A lot of people put down the lithium iron phosphate chemistry because the assumption is that it's so low, uh, such a low energy density that it's not even useful, which is very wrong. The different battery chemistries have different use cases. And we'll come back to this in a moment. I have a chart up here that we'll look at and we'll compare these different chemistries. Something really important that I think he mentioned was lithium iron phosphate will go into volume production in China later this year. And what he also said is this frees up a lot of capacity for the Tesla Semi. Currently, Tesla's making a lot of battery packs in Giga Nevada, and those battery packs are being shipped off to China to go into vehicles. So if they can switch to a lithium iron phosphate chemistry, then they can use more of the uh, nickel chemistry from Giga Nevada and the semi. That's not directly what they said, but I mean, it's, it's near enough. So I've had a theory that the Tesla semi is going to be using the high nickel chemistries from Panasonic and Giga Nevada. And this kind of confirmed that for me. To me, it sounds like the Tesla semi isn't going to use the Roadrunner chemistry, which will be unveiled at battery day because 
there's going to be plenty of cells in Giga Nevada because they no longer have to supply those high nickel cells to China. I still need to think about this a bit more, so this is uh, just pure speculation, but what if he's hinting at that possibly the short-range Model 3 vehicles in the U.S. could switch to a lithium iron phosphate chemistry? That's food for thought. If they can do that, that might significantly reduce the cost of the shorter range Model 3 and Model Y in the U.S. It depends on how cheaply they're getting those lithium iron phosphate cells in China, whether they can ship them to the U.S. and still have still get them fair for a fair price, which I don't see that that's out of the question because currently the battery cells that are going in the Model S and Model X are shipped all the way over from Japan. And all the Model Y and Model 3 cells are coming from Giga Nevada. So I think it's a possibility that they could switch the shorter range Model 3 to the lithium iron phosphate. So that was my first takeaway. Potentially the US Model 3 and Model Y could go to a lithium iron phosphate battery for the shorter range, and then they could repurpose those cells for the Tesla Semi, for energy products, etc. It's just going to be, uh, and Jerome Guillen hinted to, to something to this effect, where this allows us to diverse our, diversify our portfolio, which to me it sounds like they can start mixing and matching cells around to different products to put the cells that are ideal for a short range use case into short range vehicles and the cells that are ideal for a long range use case and the longer range vehicles. And then for the super high performance cells, you could use the Roadrunner cells. Uh, you could use those in the Cybertruck and uh, the Roadster uh, plaid versions of all the vehicles. It would be good. It would be good to see a plaid mode Model 3 and Model Y. Mine more nickel, obviously they're going to need a lot more nickel. As I'm putting together my next battery day video, it's made me realize that there's a potential for Tesla to, in the future to be installing over 100 gigawatt hours of capacity per year, which is absolutely ridiculous. I, I ran the calculations on a Terra factory with the same size uh, footprint as Giga Nevada, and I found that the cell lines for Roadrunner could, could potentially hit 15 gigawatt hours per year, which is about five times the output of the production lines at Giga Nevada. If you look at the cost of lithium iron phosphate, just the elements that go into it, this is the top chart on the screen, LFP, $8,000 battery cost for a kilowatt hour. That's about one third the cost of a nickel cobalt aluminum battery cell, which Tesla is currently using. Now this is just materials cost. So that provides the floor on the cost uh, for these battery cells. So it doesn't matter how efficient you make your battery lines for nickel cobalt aluminum battery chemistry, you may not ever get the cost down to what a lithium iron phosphate can do. So that's one key point. The other key point is if you look at the chart that's about, it's about at four o'clock, look at the decomposition temperature for lithium iron phosphate. I've said in the past that it's important to focus on the pack energy density rather than the cell energy density. And this is why. If you have a decomposition temperature that high and you have a battery chemistry that's that stable, you can actually strip out a lot of the pack weight. And you take, can take a battery cell that's actually an average energy density or low energy density, and if you can strip out that extra pack weight, then you get a battery pack that's getting pretty close to the capabilities of a much higher energy density cell because you've eliminated all that package weight. Lithium iron phosphate has an extremely high power density. It's low energy density, but it's able to shoot those ions uh, back and forth much more quickly and uh, crank out electrons without it reducing the capacity of the cell too much. 5C, for, for example, is a discharge rate of about 12 minutes. So you can discharge a lithium iron phosphate cell in 12 minutes and still have 95% capacity retention, whereas, or sorry, 85% uh, capacity retention, whereas NCA drops down to like 80%. Now, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and fire away. I do think 
eventually they will be making most of their own battery cells, but it wait, will take a few years. Right now, the, the, they're building that line at Cato Road. And the line at Cato Road, it should be built by Battery Day, but it'll be three to six months after that before they have a yield rate, a decent yield rate off of it. Typically, for the first year of production for a battery line, you're looking at 30 to 50% yield rate, which means you throw out uh, half to three quarters of the batteries that you produce. And I think this is where Redwood Materials comes in. There's really not that many batteries coming back from customers at the moment from used vehicles. Tesla vehicles have been on the road for about 10 years, and those batteries are just starting to trickle back for recycling. And that wouldn't be very much. It would be in the megawatt hour range. Whereas if they're ramping a battery cell line that's capable of 15 gigawatt hours, and they're losing 50% of those cells to defects, you're talking six gigawatt hours of cells. So that to me seems like the immediate use case for Redwood materials. What battery do you think they'll use for the mid-range Cybertruck? Same, same as the tri, uh, tri-motor? Yes, I think they will use the same battery chemistry uh, for the three different versions of the Cybertruck. Actually, now you've got me thinking. Definitely the mid-range and the long-range. The, the thing is that the, the Cybertruck is a much larger, heavier vehicle and less aerodynamic vehicle than their other vehicles, so it will need a battery cell that's very high energy density to reduce the weight so they can get a decent amount of range out, out of it. So yeah, I think it will use those road, Roadrunner cells. Yeah, if it was CATL, CATL batteries, they would be able to charge faster. I imagine what would happen is that initial boost that you get for the first, I don't know, 30 to 50% of your charge, where the battery charges extremely, extremely quickly, the lithium iron phosphate battery cell should be, be able to maintain that for longer. I didn't even think about that. That's a great point. If you, oh yeah, there's a lot of great synergies there because if you have a shorter range vehicle, it's more beneficial to have a faster charging rate because you don't have that extra range. You need to top up more often so you want a faster charging rate. Ooh, yeah, that, that really sells me on the lithium iron phosphate. That kind of tips the scale for me. If they can go to lithium iron phosphate for the Model 3 and the Model Y, I think they should. Priyanga asks, will you be making this live stream available for offline viewing? Yes, I will. I'll probably keep it on my main channel for a couple days, and then after that, I'll switch it over to my Limiting Factor 2, two channel. I want to try to keep my main channel as the one where you're kind of drinking from a fire hose and I'm giving really concentrated, well thought out information. Whereas these live streams, it's more stream of thought and I'm fumbling around a lot, uh, trying to get a grip on my own ideas while trying to articulate them to you. Yes, I do think the Roadrunner cells will have a significant improvement for charge rate, charge rate in addition to energy density and longevity. The reason for the charge rate improvement will be the fact that Maxwell Technologies allows for higher charge and discharge rates. As long as the cooling system can keep up, which I'm expecting a new cooling system as well, uh, hopefully with a plate cooling system and with the tabless electrode, a electrode to just soak the heat up out of those cells, I think it will be capable of faster charge rates. And on top of that, simply having a larger battery cell allows for a faster charge rate because that boost you get for the first 30, 30 to 50 percent of your charge, it, it lasts for much, uh, it, it provides more miles of range. For example, if you have a 300 mile range battery and the first 50% of the charge goes super quick, that's 150 miles of range quickly. If you have a 600 mile range vehicle and you can do 0 to 50% very quickly, that's uh, 300 miles of range. And this is one, uh, one of the reasons why I'm a big proponent, proponent of larger batteries versus faster charging speed. With a larger battery, you not only get longer range, you get more miles of charge more quickly when you when you do stop to fill up. So it kind of kills two birds with one stone, uh, having a, a larger battery pack. What I'm expecting to happen is that all this capacity that they're freeing up with lithium iron phosphate and Roadrunner battery cells uh, is going to free up all these battery cells at Giga Nevada to be used for the Tesla Semi and stationary storage. And I think at that point, the stationary storage business is no longer going to be cell constrained and it's just going to go parabolic and we'll see the energy storage business, I don't know, hopefully double or triple within a year. I'd have to look at the numbers to see what's uh, see what they could actually do, but it should be able to grow much quicker. 
while I'm on the topic of stationary storage, one thing I want to look into a future video is the head, I think it's the head of Argonne National Laboratory, was talking about seasonal energy storage. A lot of people are saying, well, the batteries that we have now, just they're too expensive to make anything uh, cost feasible longer than uh, like a week or two of storage. But what Argonne National Laboratory is talking about, they have, I think, a, a three-pronged battery approach. And one of the prongs of that battery uh, research approach is to focus on making battery storage so cheap that you can store energy on a seasonal basis. I need to look into that. I'm fascinated because you'd be talking well, multiple terawatt hours of storage, depending on what kind of geographic region you're talking about. But it's on my list. <sighs> Nano One. Okay, that's a good question about Nano One and how it might figure into Tesla's thinking, Richard. I had a conversation with Chris Burns the other day after he reviewed my script. I said, one of the things I said in the script was that single crystal cathode is essentially uh, an off-the-shelf technology now. And he said, well, he'd kind of dispute that because although a lot of people have the ability to make single crystal cathodes, it's the ability to make single crystal cathodes cheap that will allow it to enter the market. Now, whether they'll have those single crystal cathodes cheap enough for battery day or not, I don't know. I don't think it ultimately matters for battery day. It will be a big boost. But back to your question about uh, Nano One. There's several competing technologies, in my view, for single crystal cathode. Nano One has one of those competing technologies. They have a, it looks like a simplified, continu continuously stirred tank reactor process that requires less steps. And then you also have Novonics DPMG. Whoever wins that race to drive down the cost of single crystal cathode cheaply and does it the quickest will be the company that gets most of that single crystal cathode market share. I think there's more than room for more than one player, but one, one of them is going to be dominant. And after everything I've learned about DPMG, it looks like one of the most promising approaches. We really need to see how they execute because Novonix hasn't released the data on their single crystal cathode yet. If you look very closely at the charts that Novonix has released, they're comparing a market leading single crystal cathode and they're saying that's what our target is. They haven't actually showed the performance of the single crystal cathode yet. And they're not even planning on creating that in volume for another two years, at least two years before single crystal cathode hits volume. Whereas Nano One, I think they're ready to go now. Uh, it seems like they've had things in the works for a few years, but the problem with all these companies is they're, they keep their cards very close to their chest, so you kind of have to, have to guess. But for me, it's Nano One or Novonix look like the best horses to back in terms of single crystal cathode, and single crystal cathode will be big this decade. It's just a matter of who gets most of that pie. All right, awesome. Thanks, everyone.